All right, we are good to go. So that's the topic. So I guess everyone had lunch, right? Who skipped lunch? No one? OK. So time for a nap. It happens. I sleep. I sleep in every meeting, actually. No one knows. So it's OK to take a nap. If you feel sleepy like, take, take a short nap, 10 seconds. It's good. Rather than struggle yourself to listen to us blabbering about Spark, and I'm sure this is day two. So those, those who have started yesterday it must be really boring. So we both work in Comcast, me, Sridhar, and then Kiran is sitting right here. And then we'll just skip through this, because you can always look at the slides later. So at Comcast, I mean, we have 32 million plus setup boxes and customers and whatnot. So we have a large team of data scientists. So we have a lot of PhDs, we have analysts, we have st very strong engineers that we uh, hired just for this purpose. So there are many initiatives out of which the data science initiatives are, I can just sum it up like this, like something like customer churn prediction, what's really going on, keeping in mind that we have a lot of uh, competitors all over the place, right? The other one is a click-through analytics. How are people really looking at our content? Is it even good or not? Personalization, customer journey, modeling, you got it. But we chose a different topic today, which is anomaly detection. Last year, we showed personalization. So this time, we are showing you anomaly detection. So this is Spark Stack. This you can check in any website, so I'm not going to bore you with that. But one of the good things about Spark versus the other technologies out there which can do data science, I mean, I'm talking from a practical point of view. Like, we spent years doing all this stuff, keep doing it. We delete our code. We redo it. So from our experience, what we have seen for Spark was actually giving us more benefit than a lot of other models, not to say that other machine learning algorithms are not good. There are very specific vendors out there in the exhibitor area who actually do a better job at specific algorithms and how you can tune it. But in general, we found it very good here because we had a lot of data coming real time versus batch. And then uh, as the title says, we do have data petabyte scale. So our one of just one data set is more than a couple of hundred terabytes compressed. I mean, your the, that definitely is like 1.5 petabytes in text format. So we do work at that scale. So without waiting further, let's just keep going to the next slide. So this is something about Sparkar. Again, as I said, too generic. We don't really need to focus on that. One of the cool things they did was rather than just saying that, hey, just wait till we have all the modules there, they, Spark allows now to just look at some R-based R implementations and invoke it directly. So what do you get for that, right? You might say, I'll just use R. What you get free is the distribution, the distributed processing. It takes long time for you to build your own thing because there are many players who came before who tried to do the same. So that's why we kind of latched on to Spark R. We're kind of waiting for it. We were kind of early beta tester. We were waiting. As soon as it came in, we use Spark R quite a bit now. And then in general, Spark MLlib provides most of the algorithms. They're still adding a couple of things, like HMM model, if anyone is interested in hidden Markov model, is not yet part of Spark MLlib. Uh, there is a GitHub implementation of uh, Spark HMM, if those who are interested. So for now, we are using just uh, Hadoop and R. And Kiran will talk more about what are we doing in the interim, which is Hadoop and R, and how we plan to move at some point. So this is just by Spark. So let's cut to the chase, right? What is anomaly detection really, right? Anomaly detection is something out of the ordinary, right? That's the thing. If I dress myself as Barney, right? And then I'm walking like a dinosaur here and there, that's an anomaly. You know, none of the speakers do that. You should not do that. If I do it, that's the last spark summit for me. So that's the anomaly, right? Oh, please, please don't do that. Okay. So what is anomaly in data science? Like, what is anomaly for Comcast, really, you might be asking. Uh, for legal purposes, we can't exactly say all the data sets that we are using and what anomalies we are trying to say. But I can show, uh, tell you something very simple, right? Is a particular area prone to more device failures than the other area? That's an anomaly. It could be due to any reason. It could be because there are a lot of birds there, right? Birds might be sitting on the cable wire which is hanging there. That might be the reason. But how do you find that? How do you find it at a petabyte scale? Petabyte scale only because we, have, we collect lots of uh, uh, sensor data, lots of sensor data from lots of setup boxes and the modems and then amplifiers. We collect those signals because for us, it's very important to quickly find out what's happening. So that kind of data is anomaly. So just like you can detect that if I dress up as Barney, that's an anomaly. 
we try to detect anomaly. But at this scale, at the petabyte scale, the big difficulty is what to really focus on. That is the big problem for us, what to focus on. You tell me. Do you want me to look at the power consumption of the amplifier? Fine, I'll do it. What about the radio frequency? Fine. Then someone will say, what about the color of the box? I don't know. Maybe it has something to do with the chemicals in the paint, which you're using to paint the box, right? You never know. So that is the kind of problem that we kind of face constantly. We have teams of data scientists, but this is the struggle they have. What do you really do? So for us, we needed something very large scale. It just scales. Uh, it scales to like 400 plus nodes. Currently, we do have 400 plus uh, physical nodes. You're talking about uh, 128 gig RAM with 24 cores each. So the storage area alone, right now, we take up to eight petabytes. And that's where we run the Spark cluster because that's the power we needed to test out new theories. And uh, during the last slides, I will, I'll show you some interesting facts. Those who are like serious data scientists here probably will be like, eh, meh, right? But some of you might find it very interesting that uh, everyone talks about k-means, 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 but there are other things better than k-means. That's what we'll show in the later slides. So I will skip to the next slide. All right. Okay, that's good. So these are the most popular algorithms, and then I'll let Kiran speak more in depth into. So he's a hardcore data scientist by heart, so he's going to tell you what happened really. But in general, if I just give you 30 second overview of this, all four together, K-means is simply looking at, uh, okay, this is a person A, how far is he from person B in terms of everything, in terms of your height, weight, your dressing sense, do you wear glasses, those things. So that's a very simple one. Uh, the problem there is first I need to pick the K, means I need to pick like I'll have eight clusters, now please group together in eight clusters. You're kind of deterministic. You are saying I need something like this. Where the DB scan, which is the second one I mentioned here, DB scan is a more uh, advanced model where it kind of looks at the density, it kind of figures it out. Like kids playing in a playground, it kind of slowly figures it out. There's even more advanced algorithm called optic. Uh, that we'll cover if you have time or we can do it offline topic. Uh, we are always, we are here after this, so you can just talk to us. On the supervised side, we, we will look at HMM and neural networks, but due to the time constraint, we're going to look at HMM. Kiran will go through that, how we kind of accomplish HMM. And we kind of were very excited about the HMM model, but uh, Spark ML doesn't have it really. We are trying it out, but we didn't really say that we succeeded 100%, right? Not to lie, so we said, uh, let's keep it to Hadoop and R for now, and then we'll cover later. So with a further delay, I'll ask Kiran to join me and then go over some of these algorithms. Thanks, Ritam. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Kiran McGlormat. I run the Big Data Analytics team um, and all the data scientists team for Big Data Analytics and Comcast. I have a team of about 15 uh, data scientists um, in my team all doing a variety uh, of different uh, interesting work, um, uh, like you know, in, in a variety of different problem areas. We build a lot of models. We run it on a variety of different data sets. And then, um, so coming back to this one, uh, the anomaly detection, right? So this is a problem that we've been looking at for close to two years now. And anomaly is not always a bad thing. Uh, in like, you know, in a, like for example, if you are analyzing TV viewing data, right? So um, if, if it's a normal uh, behavior for people to tune away on certain programs, let's say a routine like you know, news program or something like that, the moment a, an ad shows, and if we see a be behavior where the viewer just tunes out of that uh, particular program normally, then like, you know, when we find, find somebody who all, who's always just stay, like, you know, staying tuned to that particular program um, like, you know, some of the time, then that's like, you know, in a sense anomaly. Like, you know, the, there's a, several, uh, there are several degrees of confidence in that, but that's an anomaly. But uh, on the flip side, if you want to do some context aware uh, anomaly detection in the Super Bowl, it would be an anomaly if somebody would be tuning away when the ad comes. Most people are interested in seeing the ad. So that is like, you know, context aware anomaly detection as well. And uh, coming back to a little bit of um, like, you know, more context in there. So uh, we have all kinds of anomaly detection problems. Like, you know, for example, uh, if we want to do some deterministic one, we want to go and look at anomalies on data sets that are already being uh, ingested into our cluster. It, it represents historical data and the history could be just um, as recent as an hour ago or even could be many months ago. 
then we want to go and analyze all of those data sets and we want to see what were the different like you know breakpoints and uh, like you know or the uh, abnormal events that happened in there and what caused it so we want to correlate those kind of abnormal events with other abnormal events that went on in some other operational area for example if we like you know if we anticipate somebody like you know if somebody was calling in into our call centers we handle millions of calls every year in our call centers right so we if we want to anticipate a heavy call load uh, then we want to go back and trace like you know what are the other events that happened like you know around high call area like you know calling uh, frequency like you know kind of like you know uh, time intervals and we want to go and like you know detect other anomalies that happened in maybe like you know in the signal strength failing to the home health data to the other devices or like you know it could be n number of events so we want to correlate a lot of that data like you know after doing some anomaly detection on the data at rest and then there's a new class of problems for like you know anomaly detection on data that like you know needs to be analyzed as it arrives in a streaming form so and then we wanted like you know that when it comes into a streaming form then it becomes more of a predictive anomaly detection we want to say, like you know analyze the states the previous states that like you know and the all the levels that happened in the previous like you know um, like you know or the most recent observations and we want to see like you know what's going to happen or we want to predict what's going to happen in the immediate like you know future in the next 15 minutes or one hour or whatever that is so i'll like you know the, so i'll cover a couple of algorithms that we uh, used uh, there are again many ways of solving this problem uh, k means is just one of them if you are a statistically minded person a simple way will be like you know just look at the outliers from uh, using a bell curve model if there are let's say like you know two, over two standard deviations in either direction then it's an an anomaly it's a very simple one it doesn't require a lot of computational strength to do it but it doesn't always lend itself to uh, like you know clear analysis due to several several deficiencies in that approach so the, in the k-means clustering one, like you know, our main uh, major objective here is to just identify the cluster to which, like you know, any given data point belongs to, and just say, okay, if it falls into a certain cluster, let's say cluster number three, then it's an anomaly for all practical purposes, and then we'll take some action accordingly. So we used a lot of k-means, uh, like you know, approaches. Now the Spark uh, shines in that manner, in that respect, actually. So. We have like, you know, like uh, we have used it in, in our uh, data sets. Now this is a very sim like simple sample data set. Again, the numbers there could, be, could represent any, anything, right? Any operational area. It could be, for example, the number of uh, minutes or micro milliseconds that callers are waiting in a call queue. It could be the bandwidth downloaded or uploaded. It could be uh, the number of tune-ins and tune-outs. It could be any number. Right, so again, like you know, we want to just first build a cluster, and then we want to create a cluster index, and then we just want to group them accordingly. And this is for the data that's at rest. So uh, ultimately, that was a sample data set, and this is the goal. We want to create an extra column over there uh, with, uh, like you know, with the cluster indexes zero, one, two, three, whatever that is. And like you know, we can say, hey, if it falls in cluster number three, then it's a problem. Let's go see what happened there. So, the, so that was the sample data, and then this is the like you know the sample Spark code that we can use. All it does is like you know we build a, a very quick model on a training data set. We like you know that's just normal Scala code if you've uh, if you've seen that. Um, and then all we want to do in the last uh, like you know couple of lines is we just want to predict which um, particular like you know cluster that it falls into, and we just take action accordingly. Now that is for the data address. Now the, the hidden Markov is uh, actually it's a it's a nice uh, model that is very robust. It it uh, has a very high accuracy rate. Like you know, 90, 92 percent of the time we can predict very uh, very accurately exactly like you know what that anomaly or like you know what the problem area was. And this thing is a state aware kind of a like you know like a model. Um, if somebody is statistically minded here, they can like you know they would understand all these things. But all it say means is depending upon the like you know the previous states uh, of the actual data in the pre immediate preceding intervals we you know, com compute some state transition probabilities over there and then we use those probabilities to say okay like you know when the data like you know arrives like you know right now depending upon the immediate preceding like you know five or six data points or n number of data points we'll say we'll predict with a very high degree of confidence what the next uh, observation is going to be and then what that like you know depending upon the level of that observation we can say okay that observation was either an anomaly or not an anom anomaly 
again, like, you know, intrusion detection is actually a common thing area, like, you know, that, um, uh, that can be used as an example over here. But, uh, like, you know, like, that's some mathematics over there. All it says is that, like, you know, they are uh, independent probabilities. Uh, like, you know, uh, when you look at the actual data itself, we use those ind independent probabilities to calculate the state transition matrices that to detect the hidden state. Or like, you know, the, the interesting, like, you know, the, the behavior in that data that we want to predict is in that hidden state. So for this particular purpose, as Sridhar mentioned, we don't really have a uh, Spark-specific implementation over here. So we had to go out and build it in R and then use the Hadoop streaming approach. Again, this was like, you know, before all the nice IDEs and everything that we see uh, when I walk through the vendor booth over there. We didn't have all of this last year when we built all of these things. So we just use the standard Hadoop streaming approach, like, you know, simple map and reduce R functions. And this thing, like, you know, we just let it loose on the existing data sets, and then we just, like, you know, let it run on, like, you know, on data as it arrives as well. And uh, performance-wise, uh, like, you know, we, we have about 1.7 billion observation or data points that come in, and, like, you know, within 30 minutes, I can process all of that data if I'm processing historical data. But if it's real-time data, it just works, like, you know, it's a, in, almost inst instantaneously on a cluster that has about 380 nodes right now, and we have a very high accuracy in detecting these kind of states. So, um, oops. So I'll let uh, Sridhar continue over here. Basically, we are believers in Spark. We, um, we are going big time with Spark all over the place, and we are scaling uh, as quickly as our cluster allows and as the vendor support uh, allows us to do it. So I'll let Sridhar continue. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, all right, let's continue on. So I'll just go back a little bit. So I think some of you were trying to take a mental snapshot of this, what this really means. So this is just our code, of course. And the k-means you saw it, there are a variety of k-means APIs now. They're improving it quite a bit in Spark, right? There is a batch mode, but there's also a streaming mode. So the idea is that once you try to train your model based on uh, for example, network detection, network anomaly detection. So my previous job was in cybersecurity, so we did a lot of that. So basically, you just take all the packets, which source talks to which destination. It's very easy to understand that's why for us. So we know who talks to who. So can you actually cluster that? Can you cluster the servers versus the clients, which countries are coming into your website, and then just see what's normal? Like, what's normal? What's the normal bandwidth? Usually, they kind of come to your website, look at three or four pages, they probably leave. But what if they're doing web crawl, right? If they do web crawl, that's so easy, right? If you have a Mac, you can do it right now. Wget-r, done. It will scan the entire website. So all those things you need to detect. So I'm just showing you a couple of examples because we have people from mixture of backgrounds. So that relates to you very easily, right? So what Kiran said was exactly right. So when people call in to report a problem, as I said earlier, making fun of the bird sitting on the wire, uh, is actually true. It happens sometimes. So how do you detect that? So the various techniques of k-means is what we're going to spend some time on, just looking at some of the things. And then uh, what we will do is we'll convert the last few minutes to Q&A session, and then we can follow through. That's why I asked uh, I requested Kiran to stay here. So this is k-means in Spark, so the variety of k-means. Like many people are not aware that there are so many varieties that you can actually do. So the basic k-means is very simple. So for those of you who are newer to data science, it's very easy. You're simply computing. You pick a random point right there, and right there I point to two people. You guys are the clusters. And anyone else will look at how far they are in terms of number of rows, and then they will choose you. So if, uh, for example, the gentleman in the green t-shirt, he'll probably choose this cluster, whereas that cluster. So it's a very... A manual kind of process, you're just computing distances like Euclidean, Euclidean distances is the most common one. Just compute distances and keep assigning yourself. And we repeat the process over and over again. At some point, you don't really change much at some point, right? Then we say that is your K, that is your set of clusters. So the second one you see is fuzzy K means. So what happened was we actually are using this. We are trying this out now, fuzzy k-means. You cannot literally assign a single person to a single cluster always. It is going to be uh, more negative than positive many times because you want to be somewhere in the middle. Like, can I belong to two clusters be, depending on which angle I'm coming from? So fuzzy k-means is simply 
saying that each point can actually have association with multiple clusters at the same time. Very powerful. So if you are exploring that, you can look at it. I'll also uh, give you the titles of the books where you can start exploring these things. K-means plus plus or parallel, that's actually very important, especially for Comcast it is. Uh, if you start with K-means, usually you start with some kind of cluster assignments and you start your algorithm there. But who's going to assign that when I'm giving you 1.7 billion events a day? Can you do it? Then that will become the bottleneck. We'll never finish our work. So what we do is we use this, I mean, this excellent K-means parallel. So the actual uh, assignment of the initial clusters itself is parallelized is very, very efficient. And actually, that's the default method in Spark ML. Uh, probability distribution, often we actually have some use cases where we do probability distribution of where this should be, because we are not going to be like a, like a bull through a paddy field or something. That's the saying in India, of course. But we just don't do that. Uh, you know, there's something that doesn't make sense. I can't just put all the internet users and the video on demand users together. So there's some common sense. What is the probability that he might belong there and here? So probability distribution is also key. So these are the elements that we look at. The hierarchical clustering is fairly new to Comcast, so we are still exploring it. The two things, uh, agglomerative and divisive. Agglomerative is uh, pretty much from top, bottom to up, and divisive is top bottom. So what that means is, uh, in your use case, you might be thinking that, can I actually have subclusters, like tree clusters? is actually a very valid use case. As I said, uh, many, many uh, YouTube videos are Google sites, they stop at the first k-means, but these are the things that we are looking at. So there is a hierarchy in clustering, that's what we observe, because for us the Northeast Division, Comcast, is different from West Division, which is different from Central Division. So for us, we need a tree-based clustering. We can't group everyone together in the same thing. Uh, the same thing with the regions, we have something called marketing areas. The Hollywood customers are quite different than the guys who are living in Manhattan or whoever is living in Ohio or Iowa, some farm country, right? So that's why the hierarchical clustering is important because we kind of play different angles there, uh, divisions, regions, DMA, city, state. Uh, we also include something called MRC, MRM, like your, like what's the revenue, right? What's the revenue? What's your typical usage? If you're only looking at uh, the local channels, that's a different thing. So we had to kind of do hierarchical clustering, we played with both agglomerative, which is the uh, bottom two up. You start with smaller points and we slowly build it up. The divisive is you start from the United States and you start building it like this. And so both are examples of a tree-based clustering system. Bisecting is just, uh, obviously, you just bisect the clusters at some point. Streaming k-means is only possible in Spark at this point because that's beautiful. As soon as we're getting new events, uh, that is still in the experimental stage for us because we are recently finished our implementation of reliably getting all these tune events from various setup boxes. So streaming came is our plan is that now that we have these batch models which are continuously updating the clusters, of course we do store the clusters somewhere, so we store both in HBase and Cassandra right now. So if you wanted to know that, that's where we store it because we need something high speed, right? So as soon as the models are being built, we have varieties of models. We kind of store them in Cassandra and HBase. HBase is for batch processes because it uh, integrates very well with the MapReduce infrastructure because we have other teams who are still in Java. And the Cassandra is very, very popular for us because we can quickly look it up. Model number M21, uh, date February 15th. This is the result. So we kind of use many, many results. So we have a modeling database for that. And then uh, APIs on top, how to retrieve that. So streaming cabins is something we are using now to quickly predict as soon as the event is coming in. For example, the RF amplifier. Amplifier is sending a signal. We want to quickly find out, okay, what's happening? Is this related to something I saw before? Do I learn from it or not? Because you can't just build the models. It's a, it's a practical tip for you guys. You can't just build the models and like, hey, I'm done with the models. Let's sing Kumbaya and that's it. Just use the models for next six months. You'll fail miserably. Don't do that, ever. You have to have a, a strategy how you'll update models, when you'll update the models. So we are still working on several algorithms there. One of them is called, called the confidence score. So we are trying to build like a way, okay, can we have a confidence score in this kind of a model? So they, we're still experimenting a lot. I think we made some breakthroughs recently. Uh, but as you know, there is no single answer. So you have to st uh, strategize what is your confidence score measurement level. So that actually applies to k-means also. 
This is another very important slide for you. Those who are actually going to go seriously into k-means for anomaly, now that you've seen the advanced algorithms, it's very important to understand how to analyze your clusters also. This slide will have the link there, that's why I put it there. So you can just go through it. There are different ways how you can measure your clusters, how good you are. So the Davis Bolden or Dunn or Silhout, but basically they just look at different types of clustering problems. So you have to first spend some time understanding what kind of clustering you're doing before you can actually use this. But this is an excellent link that I just included there. Just look at it. So it's not just the distance measurement and the error. You know, that's the main model that everyone uses for in machine learning, but that's not enough really. So depending on your use case, you can choose either of these, right? Or any of these three. And there might be a lot more too. So if you have more suggestions, feel free to email us. We'll definitely learn more. And then I'll just uh, go here and then we'll start the Q&A. So these are the very, the top two books, my favorite books. Uh, the first one is the Advanced Analytics with Spark, excellent book by mainly Sandy Riser from Cloudera, it's amazing. So they cover a lot of these concepts that I'm talking about. The second one is Machine Learning with Spark, they also cover quite a bit. In fact, if you have those two books, you probably don't need this talk. I'm, I'm serious. So they already cover a lot of these things, very, very fascinating things, like how you can use clustering, how you can do taxi cab clustering in Manhattan. So they cover very advanced models and they work through some examples uh, from where you can start. So that being said, we are hiring. Comcast is hiring. Jobs.comcast.com. That's it, everyone took a picture, good. <laughs> Thank you for that and we'll do the Q&A now. All right, questions please. Over there. Quick time check please. We have eight minutes. Eight minutes, okay. All right, I'll walk there. All right, here we go. Yes, sir. Thank you, a hey, nice presentation. If you're using Spark to distribute a, a workflow and then run R code on each of those snippets, you're actually building many HMM models, not one. And you're identifying anomalies at the node level. In other words, you're identifying a set of anomalies on this node, a set of anomalies on this node, a set of anomalies. Have you verified that that gives you the same set of anomalies as if you were able to run a process on the data, you know, with a single model on the whole set of data? I'll let Kevin ask that. Yes, because our samples within each node are very, very big. If they're smaller samples, I would agree with you that like, you know, they would, we could find differences in the way the anomaly detection like, you know, algorithms would work, but our sample sizes, even on a single node, are very big, and they're in the order of billions. So with those things, like, you know, the variations between the, like, the individual node level performance, like, you know, the numbers and the output is, uh, is almost negligible. Uh, we verified those things. They are at random, yes. Yeah. All right, please. I actually have a couple of questions uh, in relation to use of uh, Spark R uh, in your case. Um, the first question I have is, um, can you share some details on how you started with these large petabyte scale data, set, data sets? Did you break down the data sets into smaller data sets and what kind of APIs you used? Whether you mixed and match, match Spark R with native R to take advantage of, of the vast libraries that native R provides for machine learning. That's my first question. And second question is really related to performance. Did you kind of use data frames, or data frame functionality in R? And I'm curious whether you used uh, data frame in com and compared that with something like pipes. Did you use pipe R, things like that? If you could talk about it, thanks. So one simple answer is we haven't really used pipes yet. Yeah. We are still, we use data frames and then RDDs. Uh, but uh, since we have a lot of legacy code also, it's like a mix and match. So we are not 100% on Spark. We also have Java, we also have MapReduce code. Uh, we in fact use Pig and Pive at some points. But the thing is, there's a lot of Java code that goes into preparing the data. It's not like ETL, ELT, but it's a large scale uh, stuff because uh, I'll tell you one of the big reasons why we had to do that. 
Uh, one of the things that Spark can do best is doing distributed processing, but it's still a little bit away from how you can cache the data and share it across, right? We still have some way to go, although you can start using some tachyon or other shared memories or flash arrays, we're still not there yet. So it's very important that you also recognize the traditional Hadoop MapReduce does have its benefits. For, a, for a, In our case, we build some caches in memory, but we also have some caches like a B plus tree based caches. So there's a lot of reference data that goes in the streamed events, which are st staying at rest. So the petabytes are actually raw data signals. So we need a lot of other signals to mix and match probably like at least six different data sets that we bring in, starting with the account or division or the program description and whatnot. So we still rely on our traditional methods and then the end result then uh, is on HTFS, so we just read it through Spark. Yeah, go down. So um, on that note, we have a, like, you know, our teams for data ingest. As you can imagine, data science, like, you know, literally for us, uh, 60 to 80% of the work is just in, spent in actual data set preparation. Right, so we have a separate team that does the data ingest into our Hadoop cluster. And then we have a separate team just to, like, you know, whose job is once it arrives in Hadoop, just prepare it so that we can run it through our models and like, you know, through all of the analysis code and everything. So to answer your question, we spent a lot of time just preparing our data sets on that petabyte scale. It doesn't always arrive in a nice, clean, like, you know, format the way I showed it to you, right? I have to mix it, match it, like, you know, data, do a lot of cleansing on it and then prepare it and then run it through the models. And uh, to answer your question about Spark R, um, like um, as uh, Sridhar mentioned, we don't use pipes. We've just used the Hadoop streaming approach where like, you know, the, the basic, like, you know, very fundamental test for that is if I can just cat it, like, you know, from a Unix command line on your, like, you know, laptop without any Hadoop or anything and cat the output into a map kind of an R and then output, like, you know, the, the take the output from that map.r and then cat it into, pipe it into reduce.r, for example. If that works, then it, there's a very high degree of confidence that when I deploy it using Hadoop streaming into the Hadoop cluster, it will just plain work. So to answer your question, like, you know, that's the mechanism that we are using at this time. We are not mixing and matching R, like, you know, the richness of uh, traditional R with Spark R yet. We haven't gotten there yet, but, you know, we are slow to just, like, you know, rise up to that kind of uh, sophistication. Our, the problems that we solve require, like, you know, just traditional methods many times. And we, as and when we have time, we have to, like, you know, start pushing the envelope, you know? So to further add to that, I can tell you some of the techniques we are using outside Spark to encounter that kind of problem. Uh, one of the use case was Monte Carlo simulation where we had lots of algorithms. So obviously you can just do it in Spark because in Spark you cannot control that this worker node is working on that algorithm. I can't run 100 algorithms at the same time on same data in Spark. You, there are techniques which we use to kind of hack through it. One of them is assigning some kind of a pseudo number everywhere. So when the worker nodes look at the pseudo number, it automatically picks, hey, that's algorithm one, algorithm two. The other approach that our engineers have tried is ACA-based model. ACA is, of course, used within Spark, but in ACA, you can actually control exactly how many nodes work on this algorithm. So there are two ways we can do it. I can actually explain more. It's very easy to hack through the system, like how to make Spark work on a distributed scale, yet do exactly what you want to do, right? The other one, as you mentioned, is very, very important to understand. We have many techniques we use to prepare the data. One of the like very uh, not Spark technique, is there anyone here from Spark? But we use Storm there. We also use Storm. So Storm is very good at this uh, high-speed real-time ingest. So we have a lot of regular expression evaluators there, which kind of look at all the signals. Because as you know, Comcast is a big organization with hundreds of different teams. So we do not have the say in how they should log anything. We have logging all the way from Avro format, JSON format, text, GZ, Snappy. They put whatever they want. So for us, we wrote a variety of techniques. That's why we have Storm cluster, which kind of just rips everything apart, does some regular expression conversion. Uh, we kind of uh, reverse engineered a lot of the logs from that point. So that's the data preparation. Uh, any more questions? We have one minute, so. One more. One more? Yeah, hi. Uh, I just have one question on the adaptive model that you mentioned. So particularly when you mention about anomaly detection, and if there is a particular event which is an anomaly, and uh, you are supposed to identify the anomaly, which is obviously a deviation from your norm. But if you take that anomaly and then make it adaptive to your model, is now no anomaly not skewing uh, the, 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 the norm as you will? 
So the questions are important as, as we mentioned that there are many techniques you can use to do real time anomaly detection and whatnot. But you cannot take every anomaly directly and ingest it because there are outliers. That's what Kiran mentioned earlier. There are always outliers. Super Bowl, right? The bandwidth goes to the roof. That is an anomaly. That is, should not be taken as a norm. Then you're going to skew the data for the next 11 months. So that's why we have all this uh, confidence scores and other techniques where we decide if something should go or not. That's the reason we are using Cassandra HPACE to store the intermediate suspicious events. And then there's another process how we filter them out and take some of them. I think we're out of time. Thank you very much. Hope this was useful to you. Thank you, Sridhar. Thank you, Karen.